Hello friends, welcome back to this online lecture series on Earthquake Resistant Design of Structure. Now as we have been discussing in the previous series, the focus was on the ductile detailing in reinforced concrete structures, where we have seen the ductile detailing of columns, ductile detailing of beams, ductile detailing of beam column joints, and lastly we have discussed the ductile detailing of shear walls as well as the importance of providing shear walls in building. Right? From today onwards, we are starting with a new series that will be focusing on one more earthquake resistant feature that if this particular feature is introduced in the building then it gives us an option that the performance of the building can be enhanced under the effect of strong ground shaking that is you can say the strong earthquake if it is going to be there then as a result of that the provision of this particular feature that we are going to discuss in the couple of lectures ahead is going to help us achieve the better performance of the structure and the earthquake resistant feature that I am talking about nothing but the base isolation system. Now, as we have all very well familiar with the term base isolation, our focus in today's lecture will be understanding the need of introducing the base isolation system in the structure, then the principle of base isolation system and also the suitability of base isolation system will be discussed in this particular session. So, if I first of all talk about the need of introducing the base isolation system because earlier the discussion was focused on the provision of ductile detailing in case of reinforced concrete buildings in order to enhance its performance right but the observation is such that in some of the cases it, it has been observed that the kind of behavior that you are going to assume or the kind of behavior that is predicted by use of ductile detailing is not actually achieved on site and due to this particular reason another system or another approach is likely to be kept in mind or kept, kept as a backup which will help us to improve the structure's performance further, right? So, if I look at the reasons why base isolation system is preferred, then in that case, I can say that if you know, if you, have, if you remember, initially we have discussed that there are basically two types of static analysis method. First is the uh, two types of analysis method. First is the static analysis method and second is the dynamic analysis method. In case of static analysis method, we have seen that the calculation of lateral forces or shear forces applied on the beam, applied on the building are calculated using the seismic coefficient method, right? Now, we have discussed in detail in the lecture of method of analysis, the pros and cons of the static method of analysis and the dynamic method of analysis. But only the calculation of forces is not important. Along with the calculation of forces, we have seen that ductile detailing of the structure is going to play an important role. But we need to establish a relation or we need to understand that how static or the seismic coefficient method is going to include the ductile feature in its own as a result of which the combined performance of the structure can be achieved. So, if the observation, if you look at the observations that have been done from the past earthquake, then it is seen that the seismic coefficient method is basically calculating the forces based on the fundamental time period. And as a result of that, the dynamic response of the structure, that is the real time response when the earthquake load is going to be applied, is going to be not obtained to us. If only the seismic coefficient method or the static analysis is done. If you want to understand the real time performance, then in that case, the time history method is the preferred method which you can adopt for understanding the performance of the structure better. And secondly, the other thing that is observed is that the kind of assumption that we are having that if you are going to do the ductile detailing of the structure, then the behavior of the structure is going to be so and so under the effect of lateral load that is also not exactly achieved or not satisfactory when you see in real life. Now, what can be the possible reasons that in spite of discussing so much on the ductile the necessity of providing ductile detailing and in spite of providing all the features or providing all the uh, following all the clauses in the detailing part, how is it possible that the ductile detailing cannot be achieved on site? Then there are three reasons that are attributed here as you can see in the slide over here. The first reason is the strong column weak beam theory that we are assuming. That is the size of the column should always be greater as compared to that of the beam so that the stiffness of column is greater. And if the stiffness of column is greater then the failure is going to be a local failure and global failure can be avoided. That is what we have seen in this tenth hierarchy, right? But what happens is that the Structure component is going to be integrated with the architectural component of the building also and aesthetic component of the building also. So several times what happens is that the size of the column is going to hamper the functionality of the building or functionality of the room or it is going to 
disturb the aesthetic performance or it is going to disturb the aesthetic look of the room for a particular building. So as a result of them, sometimes you face this restraint from the architect or from the planning person that so if you are going to provide the size of the column so and so, then it is going to be better if you are going to flush that with the size of the or thickness of the wall. Now the thickness of the wall is usually going to be either 115 mm or 230 mm for frame structures, right? So, however, the code presently is telling that the minimum size of the minimum width of the column should be 300 mm. So, when I am going to provide a column of 300 mm width or greater, then in that case, what is going to have? There is going to be an offset of the column in the particular room. And when that offset is going to be there, then the possibility is that the furniture layout is going to be disturbed and the aesthetic look of that particular room is also likely to be disturbed. And for the same reason, we are going to face the resistance from the architect or the developer, right? So, sometimes this possibility or this implementation of strong column big beam is not going to be possible for us, right? Sometimes the economic constraint is also there and due to this economic constraint also, the sizes of the columns and the beams, uh, sizes of the beams are compromised in order to keep the economy in mind. So, as a result of that, the first criteria or the first point why ductility, the assumption of ductility or the behavior of ductility that we have on paper is not seen practically on site, then the first reason is that the strong column big beam theory may be compromised in several cases. Then the second case is the shear failure of the columns may not be totally avoidable due to the presence of implicit presence of short column effect. This also we have discussed in length that when you talk about short column effect, then the short column effect is going to be of two types. First is the explicit type and second is the implicit type, right? Where the explicit, explicit type is there, where there is a difference in the slab levels or the floor levels. Then in that case, you can visually see and you can tell that the short column effect is likely to be there. Or if the building is there on the slopey ground, then also you can say. But the implicit effect is there, where there is a partial opening is there and below the partial opening, the wall is provided. So in that case, the lateral strength is going to be reduced in the portion where the opening is provided, a lateral strength is going to be more where the wall is provided. So, as a result of that, the short column effect is again likely to come into picture and this is going to be of the implicit type. So, due to this implicit present of the short column effect, the ductile behavior of the structure is going to be hampered to some extent. And lastly, considering the ductility criteria for the beam column joint, so as a result of that, there is lot of congestion at the beam column joint due to additional reinforcement, due to the special confining reinforcement that you have to provide, the criteria of encourage, encourage length that you have to provide that is LD plus 10 times bar diameter. So, considering all these criteria, it is observed that the beam column junction is very stressed junction and it is highly reinforced junction. And due to this, sometimes the possibility is such that the proper detailing or the proper execution of this joint is not done on the side. And as a result of that, this joint becomes a weak joint and from there on the performance or the ductile behavior of the structure is compromised, right? So, these are three primers, prima facie reasons based on which the ductile behavior that we are assuming on paper is maybe differentiating from the one that is observed or that is observed or observed on the side. So, as a result of these two reasons, the need has, need arise that there has to be some alternative system also in place which will overcome the shortcomings of the ductile behavior or the ductile detailing. And as a result of that, this system that has come into picture is known as the base isolation system. Now, we are all pretty much familiar with the term base isolation because we have been hearing this particular theme term from the very beginning that is from the undergraduate level only, right? But how it is connected with earthquake engineering that will be discussed in this lecture today. Now, as you can see, base isolation, two words, base and isolation. So, base, it is indicating the location where this particular system is going to be implemented and isolation is indicating the function that you are going to achieve through this installation of the system. That is, the primary function of the system is going to isolate the superstructure from the ground. So, as a result of that, I can say that whenever the base isolation system will be there, then it is going to be a system which is going to essentially isolating the structure from potential damage that is caused due to the ground shake. That is, whenever the ground shaking will be initiated, then it will isolate the superstructure from the ground level and as a result of that, the transfer of forces or transfer of acceleration, ground acceleration to the structure will be very nominal or almost negligible, right? And that is why it is known as base isolation system. Now, seismic isolation is a design strategy when this particular thing will be happen, then as a result of that, the uncoupling action will be taken. Why? Because the ground and the structure is going to be isolated from each other and as a result of that, the transfer of forces is not going to be there. 
and that is why it is known as an uncoupling action that will be taking place right and the term isolation refers to reduced interaction between the ground and the superstructure and whenever this seismic isolation is going to be installed beneath the structure then it is known as base isolation system next if we look at the further the concept of base isolation then the concept of base isolation is that the other purpose of providing base isolation system is to reduce the use or the other other purpose of base isolation system is to provide an additional means of energy absorption from the ground towards the structure that is whenever the energy will be reduced due to ground shaking then as a result of that the energy will be absorbed by this base isolation system and only a small percentage of that energy will be transferred to the superstructure and as a result of that the large deformation or lateral displacement in the structure can be avoided this 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 uh, decoupling allows the building to behave more flexibly which will improve the performance of the building right so whenever this base isolation system will be installed and as a result of that the system will be become the superstructure system will be becoming more flexible and when it will becoming more flexible then as a result of that the duct it will be going towards the ductile behavior of the structure that we are initially uh, estimating and based on that we can say that the performance of the structure will be much better so as you can see over here in the figure a ground structure a structure is shown which is supported on the ground now between the ground and the structure the rollers are installed whenever these rollers are installed then what is going to happen is that then it is an idealized schematic system that is shown which is not actually practical practically going to be possible on uh, in case of field but just to understand the concept of base isolation so if you are going to have this kind of system then what is going to happen is that whenever the ground shaking will initiate then as a result of that the rollers are going to move and the rollers are going to move but the structure is not going to move as a result of that the ground shaking effect that is the energy that will be released from the effect of ground shaking will not be transferred to the superstructure above right but in this case there will be limitation about the movement of rollers above up to what extent the movement of the rollers can be allowed but this is an idealized case right but the concept is to just give you an idea about how this system is going to act right now we talk about the concept of base isolation then the concept of base isolation is prepared or it is decided based on three or four parameters where the first parameter is the period shifting of the structure second is the mode of vibration third is the change in the load path and last one is the minimum rigidity so if i look at all these four parameters or that lead us to the concept of base isolation then the first parameter is the period shifting of the structure so in case of period shifting of the structure what is going to happen is that whenever the structure the base isolation device is basically going to be flexible in nature at the same time the superstructure is also going to be flexible in nature because because of the uncoupling action that has taken place so as a result of this two components that is the base isolation system is still itself flexible in nature the superstructure is also become flexible in nature so it is going to increase the flexibility of the overall system and when the overall flexibility of the system is going to increase then as a result of that what is going to happen is that the natural period of the system is going to be increased by a large amount when the natural period of the system is going to be increased then it is going to take away from the frequency of the ground motion that is taking place and as a result of that large amount of damage in the structure can be avoided right and the second thing is going to be where the mode of vibration now in case of dynamic analysis we have seen that the mode of vibration is going to be play, play a very important role and the study is to be done for the mode shape critical mode shape right whereas we have seen that the this uh, seismic coefficient uh, seismic coefficient method is focusing on the fundamental mode of frequency over here fundamental mode of vibration over here so in case of mode of vibration also it is said that for the fundamental mode of vibration initially when the base isolation system is not installed then in that case the superstructure is going to behave like a cantilever structure but when the base isolation system will be in place then as a result of that the superstructure is going to become more or less rigid in nature and when it will be rigid in nature then as a result of that the deformation in the structure is going to be limited to a great extent then the third criteria is the damping and editing of the load transmission path right so what happens is that a damper or energy dissipation device is also to be installed along with this so when the damper is going to be installed then what is going to happen is that it is going to absorb the energy that will be released and then the remaining amount of energy will be transferred to the structure so as a result of that the overall stress in the structure will be reduced to a great extent and at the same time 
the transmission path will also change that is the load transfer mechanism that we are we have been discussing in the earlier lecture is also likely to undergo a significant amount of change and lastly minimum amount of rigidity is also required that is if there is a uh, base shear, if there is a lateral force which is having a base shear less than that of uh, actual earthquake that is in case of wind or small minor earthquake that we are facing then in that case the structure should have minimum rigidity also to withstand itself so considering all these four aspects the base isolation system is designed now if i look at the principle of base isolation then there are four basic principles on which the base isolation system is designed first is that the movement of the structure and the ground is going to take place by the same amount that is whatever movement of the ground is going to be there same amount of movement is expected in the structure also second a building that is going to be perfectly flexible it is going to have indefinite amount of period but indefinite amount of period cannot be allowed and the second thing is going to happen is that whenever the period is going to be larger then it is going to have lesser amount of earthquake forces that it, it, it will have to resist and when it will have lesser amount of earthquake forces then as a result of that the economy will be achieved and the same time the stability in the structure is also going to be increased to a greater extent right so for this type of structure when the ground beneath the structure moves there will be zero acceleration that is zero or minimum acceleration that will be transferred to the structure above and when the acceleration transfer will be less then as a result of that what is going to happen is that the movement of the structure in the lateral direction is also going to be of very limited nature so what is going to happen is that in the other terms we can say that the ground is going to move but the structure is not going to move and the same thing is highlighted here by means of a figure where two figures are shown in the first figure the rigid structure is shown in the second figure the flexible structure is shown in case of rigid structure what is going to happen is that even though the movement of the structure is not going to be there but as a result of the ground shaking the ground acceleration is going to be transferred to the building and large amount of seismic forces are going to be acting on the building whereas in the second case the flexible structure what is going to happen is that the ground movement is going to take place and due to this ground movement the flexible system will be introduced and when the flexible system will be introduced as a result of that the acceleration that will be transferred to the structure about will be almost negligent and as a result of that the deformation in the structure and the damage in the structure can be avoided right and lastly in today's lecture we discuss about the suitability of the base isolation that is in what type of conditions we can go for the base isolation base isolation system just like in case of all other cases the codal provisions are there similarly here also some prerequisites are there if these prerequisites are followed or these prerequisites are made available then as a result of that the base isolation system can be adopted now what are these four prerequisites the first prerequisite is that the subsoil does not produce a predominance of long period ground motion that is long period ground motion should not be there for the soil condition there on which the structure is going to be constructed second the structure is fairly jointed with sufficient amount of high load that is the beam column joint should be properly connected beam and slab should be monolithically casted joint should be monolithically casted and at the same time the load transfer mechanism should be load transfer mechanism should be concentric in nature that is it should pass through the center of gravity and reach the surface of the earth then the site permits horizontal displacement of 200 mm or more that is one of the another requirement that is required for the selection of base isolation system and lastly the lateral loads due to wind where the base shear is also going to because sometimes what is going to happen is that in case of structures you need to apply the lateral load due to wind also due to earthquake also but the structure shall be designed in the case where the base shear is going to be more right so when the base shear is going to be more then in that case the other cases cannot be ignored but minimum rigidity minimum rigidity has to be provided to the structure to resist the wind loads also so in that case also it is said that the limitation should be said that the lateral load that is applied that is that is applied due to wind should be not more than 10% of the total weight of the structure so if these four guidelines or four prerequisites are followed then the base isolation system can be adopted for a particular type of structure i hope the necessity of base isolation the concept of base isolation and the principle on which the base isolation system is going to be working is clear Stay tuned for the further lecture series.